Yeah, so I'm going to talk about some uh, statistical limitations uh, of the school league tables that are published in England each year. And the particular focus is on using these league tables to help you choose uh, a school for your child. Okay, okay so I'll start with a brief history of uh, school league tables in England. So we've had them for around uh, 15 years. And the first tables were simple uh, school averages, so the proportion of children who get five or more uh, good GCSE grades in each school. And this, of course, is a very unfair way to compare schools uh, because schools also differ widely in their initial intakes at age 11. So it took a long while for the government to really respond to that criticism, but in 2002 they moved over to a value-added approach where they explicitly did adjust for intake achievement. But this was quite simply done, and it was a um, description statistics, and the value-added performances of schools were simply just stated. So these are very imprecise statistics, really, because there's only a couple of hundred children in a school, but they're stated with certainty in those first tables. So they weren't model-based, and there were no confidence intervals. Uh, but very recently, the government have actually moved over to using uh, random effects models or multi-level models uh, to compute these value-added uh, school performances. So not only do these models adjust for children's initial achievements at age 11, but they're going to adjust for the, the free school meal status of children, the gender, ethnicity, and so on. Lots of people characteristics uh, with a view that you don't want to hold, hold schools accountable for these uh, differences in the proportion of FSM children across schools. And of course, because it's a model-based approach, you can get confidence intervals very easily for the measures of school performance. Okay, so here's a, an example of a government school league table. And it's for one local authority. Uh, you can see the schools listed here. And for those four schools, the first column of numbers are the value-added scores of those schools. And they are actually residuals from a random effect model. And what the government does is they center them on 1,000, I think, because they don't want any school to have a negative score, because that might be misinterpreted by the, uh, the public. <laughs> but you can see these are the point estimates, and these are the 95% confidence intervals. So whilst it appears that two schools are less effective than the national average and three are more effective, the confidence intervals all cross 1,000, so none of these schools are significantly different. And that's, a, that's what you see a lot of because these things are very uh, imprecise. The problem is once the media uh, get this information, they often omit important parts of it or they might uh, emphasize different performance indicators. And the, it's through the media that parents will be aware of these tables, so mainly in newspapers. So here's the BBC website, and you can see that they have put the value-added score of these schools, but we no longer have the confidence intervals. So the school's performances are stated with certainty, if you like, and you could read far too much into it. Many of these schools aren't going to be significantly different in terms of their performances. But also, the uh, media typically focus on the simpler measure of the proportion of children who get five good GCSE grades. Okay, so the focus of this talk is on using these tables to choose a school, and that's the main justification that the government give for their publication. But there's a really quite important limitation which hasn't been noted before, which is that the league tables, they clearly refer to a cohort of children who have just left secondary school, a cohort of 16-year-olds. If you're choosing a school for your child, your child's 10 years old, and it's going to take six or seven years for the child to get to their GCSE exams. Okay. So for choosing a school, it's not the current performance of the schools that parents are really interested in. It's their future performance in seven years' time. So essentially what the government are doing here is they're implicitly encouraging parents to use the current performance of schools as a guide to their future performance. But the further you do this into the future, the more additional uncertainty there's going to be Okay, the less reliable the current measure is going to be of future performance. So you want to factor that uncertainty in, really, to these tables. 
Okay, so is this going to be a big problem or not? Well, it depends on how stable schools' effects are from year to year. And we know that schools' raw performances are very stable. So the proportion of children getting the five good GCSE grades, that's very stable over time. But of course, so are inequality in uh, initial performance of children on day one. Okay, so the school which always gets the high-achieving kids is always going to get good GCSE results. So in terms of value-added performances, where you've adjusted for these initial differences, you get a correlation of 0.6 uh, for value-added estimates five years apart. And whilst that's big and positive, it's, it's certainly low enough to introduce a lot of extra uncertainty when you start predicting into the future. Okay, so to really quantify this, I'm going to use the same data as the government for the tables, which is taken from the National Pupil Database. That's a census of all children in English schools. We have their test scores at age 11, key stage 2, and their GCSE exam results. We also observe their gender and uh, free school meal status, all of those pupil characteristics. And we just look at a 10% uh, random sample of those schools, and the statistical model that we use is, again, the same as the government. So it's a two-level random intercepts model. Uh, so it's the simplest multi-level model there is. So YIJ, that's a, some kind of sum of children's GCSE exams. Okay? So it's a total point score, if you like. And that's for child I in secondary school J. On the right-hand side, you adjust for their initial achievement uh, and any other pupil background characteristics. And of course, you can't explain all of the variation, so you decompose the residual variation into a school effect and a pupil effect. So it's these UJs, or, or you know, point estimates and confidence intervals for these UJs, which the government publish uh, on the school league tables. And these are just simply um, posterior estimates of the school effects or empirical Bayes estimates. And I'm just stating the standard formula here, which you find in any uh, multi-level book. And the reason for that is I'm going to show how they are modified if you want to incorporate the extra uncertainty when you're going to start to use the current data to predict into the future, to make inferences about future cohorts. So the top left is just uh, the equation for the point estimate for each school. So this is a shrunken school effect. Uh, it's associated variance on the top right. And of course, you can calculate the confidence intervals. And that's exactly what the government does. And so this would be a graphical representation of the government's school league table. So we have the least effective schools ranked uh, on the far left through to the most effective schools. Every school has a point estimate and a, a wide 95% confidence, uh, confidence interval about it. And you can see that many schools, it would be hard to separate from one another uh, or hard to separate from the national average. But the picture is going to become worse if we start to use the 2007 cohort to make inferences about how schools are likely to perform seven years later when your own child comes to their GCSE exams. So how, how much worse will the picture look? OK. So yes, we want to see whether the same significant differences essentially remain in 2014. So we need to adjust those point estimates and the, and the standard errors. And the way that we go about doing this is we consider an extension to the government's model, which takes you to a bivariate response version. So we're going to have two equations, one for the 2007 cohort and one for the 2014 cohort. cohort. Okay. And this provides a way into working out how one way that you could adjust those confidence intervals. So this is the model that uh, we consider. And it's exactly the same model as before, but with two equations. And the equations are linked only through the value-added school effects, the UJs. And they're allowed to be correlated. Uh, the pupil effects are independent because the child's in one cohort or the other. Now, normally, you know, if you could estimate this, you know, if you had the 2014 data, you would estimate this. You'd want to get the UJ in brackets 2014 there. And that would be the, you know, the posterior estimate of the school effect based on the 2014 data. We don't have the 2014 data. The most up-to-date data that a parent would have in this situation is the 2007 data. 
So you want the, the school effect for 2014 conditional only on the available data, the 2007 data. So it's a funny type of empirical Bayes estimate or a funny type of school residual. So you, it can be shown that you can derive, well, you can derive this formula quite simply, and these are the formula for these future school effects, for the point estimates on the left and their associated variances on the right. And the way I've written these is it, the terms in black are exactly the same as the standard formula, okay? And the terms in red are the extra terms which come in when you start to make inferences about future cohorts. So on the top left, the term rho is the correlation of value-added school effects seven years apart. We think that might be around 0.6. So it's going to give you additional shrinkage of your school effects towards the overall mean. And in terms of the, the variances, there's a strictly positive term, because rho is always uh, you know, between 0 and 1, on the numerator. So the variances are all going to be larger than before, leading to wider confidence intervals. Okay. Now, in writing this formula, I've made a simplifying assumption that the between school differences in uh, schools' value-added performances are the same for 2007 and 2014. And that's necessary so that the formula are only based on 2007 data. But it's not a particularly strict assumption. You, you can certainly look, use past data on cohorts, you know, uh, seven cohorts apart to test that. That's OK. So the only thing that we don't know is rho. Uh, we don't have a specific number for this correlation between two sets of school effects. OK, so what we do is we estimate the bivariate model I showed you earlier but on two historic cohorts, 2007 and 2002. That's only five cohorts apart, but that's the furthest that we can do with the available data. So what you can see, if, if you estimate that bivariate model, you're going to get an estimated correlation of 0.69 for the value-added school effects. And the scatter plot which shows a visual way of, of displaying that. So schools which are successful in 2002 are not, certainly not guaranteed to also be successful in 2007. So using this value of 0.69, we can plug that into the formula and create the modified caterpillar plot, okay? the modified confidence intervals. Okay. So this is what you get. So this is both, both graphs use the 2007 data, but the one on the left allows you to make inferences about how schools performed for the 2007 cohort. And on, the one on the right is allows you to make inferences about how schools may reform for the 2014 cohort. <coughs> so the, the underlying data is the same, it's only what's available, which is from 2007. So what you can see is the, well, there's a little bit of additional shrinkage, but the main thing is these confidence intervals are much, much wider than before. Okay. So what it's saying is that, you know, as a statistician, you're not you know, if I give you two schools, you're not willing to say that one's going to be definitely significantly def uh, better than the other in seven years' time. Okay. Whilst you can see that for many, many pairs of schools in 2007, 2014, there's just too much imprecision to make those kind of statements. Uh, okay, so hardly any schools differ significantly from the national average, and if you constructed the appropriate confidence intervals for all the pairwise comparisons, the same story of it massively increasing confidence intervals. Right. Okay, so that was the main that was the main point. That's perfect. Yeah, that was the main point in the talk. There's a secondary limitation, smaller limitation that I wanted to point out, which is that the government, in their value-added model, as well as adjusting for all the pupil characteristics, they adjust for some school-level variables, and this is to adjust all peer group effects. So they adjust for the average age 11 test score in each secondary school, and they adjust for the standard deviation of these age 11 <coughs> scores. And that's to account for the fact that if you're all other things being equal, a child exposed to a high achieving peers who are all very similar to one another tends to, what you see in the data is they have higher test scores than those children who are exposed to low achieving peers or, and very uh, variable peers. So the government put in the variables for that reason. But the problem is, by putting in these school-level variables, okay, 
you're, you're in a sense over adjusting. So parents are most, you know, the, the main thing parents are interested in is how well will my child do if they go to school A or school B. So it's what is the difference in, their out, in the child outcome. Now, part, you know, part of the reason why some schools are successful are peer group effects and partly policies and practices, but you don't want to decompose that if you're trying to choose a school. You just want to know the, the total effect. And by putting these variables in, you're starting to decompose that. But the problem is it's going to lead to a different ranking of schools where certain types of schools are going to suffer uh, more than others as a result of this. Uh, okay, so you know, putting the variables in, you're, you're removing their effects from the school residuals, which are the things which are published. So it ends up that it's quite important because what you can see here is a scatter plot. So I've estimated the simple value-added model on the 2007 data, the one that the government estimates. I've done that twice. From the x-axis, we haven't adjusted for the school level peer group variables, and on the y-axis, we have. And most schools are on the 45 degree line, and they move around a little bit. But there's this distinct cluster of, turns out, grammar schools that are all very badly affected by this. So, you know, the obvious reason is that grammar schools... Um, you have an entrance exam, so all the children, by definition, are high-achieving and very homogenous. So adjusting for those peer group effects is essentially adjusting... Well, the grammar schools reduce because they have good uh, peer group effects in that sense. But for school choice, that's an over-adjustment, you could argue. There is also a kind of a subtle point, which is that if you think... This may or may not be the case here, but if you think that grammar schools are successful in their own right through particular practices that they implement or they're able to attract better teachers. You know, if you think that, then there's an added problem, which is that these peer group effect variables at the school level are going to be correlated with these grammar school policies and practices which are omitted from the model okay, and therefore contained in the error term. So essentially, by putting in these school level peer group variables, you're inducing an endogeneity problem or a correlation between your explanatory variables and your school level residuals. And that leads to grammar schools. The way, the way it happens is that the, the coefficients on the peer group effect variables are going to be biased. They're going to look more important than they actually are. If the coefficients are biased, if the coefficients are biased, then the residuals are biased. Okay, so these grammar schools are being pushed down. Uh, it's a double whammy. They're being pushed down partly because they benefit from peer group effects, but partly because of you've introduced uh, a model violation, if you like, an endogeneity problem. Okay, so for school choice, you don't really want to adjust for any school-level variables. Okay, so to conclude, um, okay, for school choice, you're not interested in the current performance of schools, but the future performance. The government only published the current performance of schools, so there's added uncertainty when you start extrapolating or predicting into the future. If you take that into account, what you see is that you go from a situation where you were able to separate out 60% uh, of schools from the national average, but now it's just a handful, a very, very small percentage. Okay. So there's so much imprecision that these tables aren't really very useful at all for choosing a school, and it's misleading that the gov what the government publishes doesn't include that uncertainty when they're promoting them for school choice purposes. And then the secondly smaller point was that you don't want to include school-level factors because you're starting to over-adjust. As part of the effect of interest, which would normally be in the school-level residual, you put in the school-level variables, you take it out of the school-level residual, and certain schools, the schools are affected differentially by that. Okay, and, and in this, what the government's doing currently is the grammar schools are the ones which plunge down. Uh, that's it. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> nice to see you quite a Quite a good audience. Uh, thank you, Tony, for inviting me. Uh, as Tony says, I'm in this Department of Clinical Veterinary Science, and this is uh, ESRC-funded work jointly with Musa, who was uh, a postdoc on the project, and Richard, who took over from him as a postdoc on the project. Richard is also in the department. Musa is back in Iran. Uh, a brief synopsis. Uh, I'm talking... I mean, I'm, I'm in the educational research session here. I'm talking more about sample size calculations. I've sort of pigeonholed myself in because my example, the Fife data set that I'll talk about, is actually an educational example. And what we're interested in 
a brief overview of the talk is really how do we do sample size or power calculations in complex random effect models where we've got clustering in the data. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a bit of software that we've developed. Uh, I've got an initial example and a lot of background which I'm going to whiz through because I've got lots of slides. Okay, so I make no apologies for that because I want to get on to the educational bit so I can justify being here. Okay, so lots of busy slides. Uh, in social sciences, in many sciences actually, we're interested in research questions, some sort of hypothesis. A has a significant effect on B, where A and B are, are various things. And what do we do? Well, we want to answer that question, so we go out and we collect some data. Okay, and from that data we want to then test whether statistically A has a significant effect on B. In actual fact, we do it the other way around. Okay, we perform the test. Either we do find that indeed A has a significant effect on B, or we're left with two alternatives. Well, B, our hypothesis is wrong, or we may not have collected enough data. Okay, and the sufficiency of the data is the motivation behind doing a sample size calculation. Okay, so this is my, I mean, all talks are educational, but this is my example, which has nothing to do with, with education at all. A topic close to my heart. Are Welshmen on average taller than one meter centimetre? Okay, so that's, that, that's my research question. I'm gonna ask for money to get, get hold of this. Uh, so to answer that, I need to get hold of a random sample of N Welshmen. Measure each of their heights, okay? Make some assumptions about these Welshmen, say that their heights are normal, okay? Might want to check that if I'm being, being honest, okay? Then form my hypothesis and then uh, see if in, that, in fact Welshmen are tall or not, okay? And I will then obviously need to decide how many my N Welshmen is. Okay. So we'll have a null hypothesis we have our mean height for the Welshman of mu, and we want to test whether mu is 175 or mu is greater than 175. And to make things simple, we could just subtract 1 meter 75 from their, all their heights, and so we've got an null hypothesis for mean zero. And in practice, what we do, we get our sample, we get their mean, we get the standard deviation, we've got n, we form a test statistic, and we test the, the model. And of course, we have. We have some, some possible things that can go wrong. This is all very basic stats, okay? So what could happen is that Welshmen really are only 1 meter 75 on average height, but you've got a sample which includes me and my brother or something, and so you've got a very tall sample, and you'll reject the null hypothesis that way, okay? Or your hypothesis could be false, okay? And, but but you, you get a sample which, indeed, you can't say significantly that, that, that the sample is different from 1 meter 75, okay? And these are your two type, type 1 and type 2 error, okay? And we're going to be talking about beta, the power, which is 1 minus the type 2 error. <coughs> okay, so let's suppose we get a sample, mean is 180, okay? And we know, for whatever reason, that the population standard deviation is five centimeters. So we do a little bit of jiggery popery maths, and we see from that sample, okay, that we need a sample of size three Welshmen to reject the null hypothesis. And because it's a small number, we should really do a student T test rather than a Z test, and that puts it up to five, okay? If, on the other hand, we had a sample of a mean of 176, Okay, then we need 68 Welshmen. Okay, before you all start jumping up, okay, well that's kind of backwards, you know. You can't have a sample uh, of Welshmen and then say, well, I'll pick a sample of this size, because to have a sample you need to have obviously chosen the size in advance, okay. So instead what people do with power calculations is they play God, okay, and they sort of pretend they know what the sample mean is. So they choose something called an effect size gamma, which is kind of our guess, maybe from some prior data, at the increase in the sample mean for Welshmen. Okay. And then there is an approximate formula that we can, we can all merge together here, which involves gamma, okay, our effect size. It involves the size of the test alpha 
and it involves the power and also involves the sample size. Although you don't see it in that formula because it's this standard error of gamma will involve will be a function of n. Okay. So using the same numbers I used earlier, if I thought that my effect size was five, okay, so I thought that on average Welshmen were 180 tall, okay, I can plug that into the model, and I see that I get a power beta there of pretty close to one, okay, which sort of makes sense. If Welshmen are quite a way above one meter 75, then we're, we don't need many Welshmen to detect that, okay. On the other hand, if we were only just a little bit above above 175, say 176, so we've got the value 1 for the effect size, we get a very small, if we've only got 25 Welshmen, we get a power of 0.226, which is pretty small, okay? And we can do this for varying, varying ends, I've chosen 25 on the slide, and get what we call power curves, okay? So there's two power curves, you see the one which is almost up on the axis there, that's where we expect them to be five centimeters above the average, the other one where we expect them to be one, okay? okay. So that simple formula is the basis behind a lot of sample size calculations for more complicated examples, okay? It can be used in many situations, many hypothesis tests, okay? Basically, to generalize the idea, we assume that gamma is some, some parameter in the model, okay, and we've got a way of um, working out its standard error, and we use that formula, okay? I'm gonna look at an alternative approach because it doesn't work everywhere because in, in more complicated models, it's hard to work out the standard error formula, okay? And in particular, I'm gonna look at what we call cross-classified models, okay? So what are we interested in? Well, we're gonna look at simulation I've got a background in things like MCMC methods. So let's use simulation here. What are we hoping to do when we do our research? Well, we, we start off by constructing our question, forming our null hypothesis, collecting the data, and then hopefully rejecting the null hypothesis. Okay. The idea with simulation is rather than collect the data, let's simulate the data we believe and see how well we do with varying different sample sizes. Okay. Well, just to keep on with the, the flavor. How do we generate random Welshmen? Okay. Um, here's my, my ESRC bit of software, my random Welshman generator, okay, if I can get this mouse to work. Okay, it sort of generates random Welshmen. This would be how we do it non-parametrically, okay. But no, in reality, obviously, we're gonna do a parametric thing, okay. So we're gonna believe those Welshmen come from a normal distribution with mean, in our example, if we take case two, mean one meter 76, okay? So we generate as many samples as we like, really, of 25 Welshmen from a normal distribution of mean 176 and standard deviation five, okay? And each time we check whether or not the confidence interval we, we create contains the correct, um, the, the 175 that we're testing. And what we get, there are two curves there, okay? We've got the theoretical curve we got from the simple formula in this case, and we get the simulation one, which pretty much mimics it. There's a little bit of, even with 5,000, there's a little bit of, of jitter there, okay. okay? So the theoretical approach is very quick, okay, if you can derive the formula, okay? And there are approximations for more complicated situations. The simulation approach, you could general, generalize this to, to, to virtually any situation, but can be much slower, and you may need to do lots and lots of simulations to get accurate estimates, okay? There are alternatives. Here I'm using what I would call the zero one approach for that last graph, where basically every sample you generate, you have a value zero if it contains, if it doesn't contain the, the null hypothesis, value and one otherwise, and you just average over them. Instead, what you can do is just work out the standard error each time for your, for your, your simulation and find the average of them over the simulations, okay? And that improves things in terms of speed, okay? 
So we've developed um, a software package as part of the grant. Uh, like me, it's a bit old-fashioned. It's got a very text-based interface, okay? Uh, and it allows users through lots and lots of questions to specify their actual sample size scenario. And then it will go away and it will generate some code, which you can either run in MLWIN or R, depending on your, your, your uh, choice, okay? To calculate power for your particular example, okay? We do things with normal responses, binomial responses, count class on responses, one level, two level, three level, and cross-classified models. And there's lots of documentation there. Uh, and if you just Google ML PowSim, given its title, it uh, flicks off the tongue. Uh, there, there isn't many other ML PowSims in the world, so you can find it quite easily. OK. So that's not too bad. I've got 10 minutes now to talk about education. OK. So what we're going to look at now is how would we do a sample size calculation in a specific educational example. And I've got a data set from Fife in Scotland. It's one of these sort of generic data sets that's been used a lot. It's, it's used in, in Emma Wynn's user guide. And what we have is, is respond, response variable is, is attainment in exams for, for a whole cohort of pupils from Fife in Scotland. It's very topical since I've been to Scotland as well. Uh, and we've got nearly 3,500 pupils from 19 secondary schools. Okay. But we also have the primary school that they attended. And in educational research, you often want to sort of partition your variability between your pupils and your schools. But here we have two hierarchies. We've got pupils within primary schools, but also pupils within secondary schools. Okay. And for various reasons, not all of the pupils within each primary school go to the same secondary school. So you've got a cross design there. Okay. And we're going to use this actual data set as the basis for a sample size calculation. So it's sort of saying, well, what would we do if we were now going to collect some data, some exam attainment data at age 16, okay, with a simple model just looking at whether the average score was bigger than some value, okay, where we have to adjust for secondary school effects and primary school effects, both in the way we do the sampling but also in our, in our modeling. So the five data, if you round up the data slightly, I'm going to assume I'm interested in uh, whether the average mark on this test okay, is 0.5 higher than some number. Okay. So that's my beta, my 0.5. And there I've got the relative variabilities, various variance components for secondary school, primary school, and residual. Okay. So we see here that primary school in this example is more important than secondary school. And so just because um, sample size calculations exist usually for balanced data, let's suppose we can do a balanced design where we choose P pupils from each combination of a secondary school and a primary school. Okay. Now clearly this isn't very appropriate, but we'll try it just as a starting point. So we take three pupils from each combination of uh, NS secondary schools, where NS goes from 10 to 30, and MP primary schools, where MP goes from 20 to 100. So you can see why it's not feasible, because if you've got 30 secondary schools, you're taking three in each, then each primary school must have at least 90, 90 pupils in its class. Okay? And if you know anything about the British education system, it doesn't work like that, amongst other things. But let's do that anyway. Okay, so I, I, I've input all this stuff into our software, and I'm using R in this case, okay? And here we see that the power curves you'd get for having 10 secondaries, 20 secondaries, 30 secondaries, as you increase in the primary schools, okay? What's interesting is, I'd always say take three from each combination. If you take one from each combination, you don't have very much input in, in, in the prior, in the power, sorry. Okay. Now, that's not very realistic. So we've offered uh, various uh, techniques to include Im uh, imbalance in your data. Okay? Some of them don't make much sense for this example, but some of them do. So we could think about, well, non-response, which I think Harvey Goldstein talked about earlier in the week. 
okay? Or drop out of whole groups. So you may have no pupils from particular combinations of primary school and secondary school. Or two more realistic uh, examples, which I'll go on to at the end. Okay. So non-responsive individuals or non-responsive groups actually doesn't really solve this problem of it being unrealistic. But what we do see is that if we say we had 50% dropout of individuals, okay, it does reduce the power, but not very much. And if we had 50% dropout of pairings of primary school and secondary school, yet again, it, doesn't, it, re it would reduce power, but not very much. Okay. And that's because if you reduce the number of pupils per pairing, you're not really reducing the number of secondary schools or the number of primary schools, which are driving the whole thing here. So how would we do a more realistic way of doing a sample size calculation? Well, we might want to use, use a, a sort of a table approach. Okay. So let's imagine, um, okay. Okay. So let's imagine we're, we're coming in to collect data when these kids are in their secondary school. So our sampling strategy is going to go to each same secondary school and sample in pupils, which would be a fairly logical. It's probably what's been done a lot. Okay, you go to, you choose your, and then your primary school, okay, you only kind of discover at a later date because you didn't even think about it when you were doing the modeling. Okay, I mean you could be clever and and look through the list and try and sample particular combinations. Okay, so what we do then is actual fact. We need some data for this to make it work, okay? So we've actually, just for, for illustration, we've used um, the actual numbers from the real data, okay? So you've got a two-way table which says how many pupils are in each combination of primary school and secondary school. And you go down each row of the table, each secondary school, and you just choose 30 with their, their, uh, their primary schools, okay? And what you see then is that the power initially, as you increase the number of pupils per secondary school, okay, initially goes up and then sort of plateaus off. Okay. So what happens is that as you, as you start increasing the number of pupils, you actually increase the number of primary schools. But up to a point, because I have this table, I've used up all of my primary schools in my, in my table, and we don't improve very much. And if we did the same thing where we fixed the number of pupils per primary school that sampled, the se secondary school was just a label that we de derived, okay, we get a similar idea. Okay. We get a steep rise at the start where we actually pick up more and more secondary schools and then it plateaus off. Okay. The other possibility... Another way of sampling was, would be if you had a huge list of pupils, okay, just one list, then you could basically choose at random from the list. Okay. So again, this is like having the table with primary schools at the top, secondary schools going down the side, and just choosing randomly from the whole table. Rather than choosing 30 from each column or 30 from each row, just choose randomly from each, each column. Okay. And when we do that, we again get a similar thing happening, okay? As we increase the number of pupils, we're now increasing, to start with, we're increasing the number of secondary schools and the number of primary schools we reach, okay? But at some point, we've, we've got representatives from each, each cell of the table, and the power doesn't increase very much after that. Okay. Okay, so... One last thing to finish. So these, these, these methods I've been doing, we're doing lots and lots of simulation with lots of different scenarios, and it takes an awful lot of time. Okay. Uh, we've been using LMER here, okay, which we, we, but we still, it, it's, still, it's not as bad as using MCMC for each, each one of your simulations, but it still does take some time. So we wonder, well, is there any, any actual approximate formulas we can use? Okay. And there is a sort of a famous design effect formula. So here, 
if we have a very simple model where we just have pupils and schools, okay, n pupils in each of capital N schools, okay, then what we need to know is the interclass correlation rho and the number of pupils per school n, and then we can use that design effect formula there. So, for example, if, you're, uh, if your interclass correlation rho is 0 0.1, then you'll need 1.9 times as many pupils as you would from a simple random sampling scheme. Okay. So what we propose okay, is, a, is a formula for cross-classified models where you basically, there's a nice cross in the middle of it, you take this design effect formula and you do it for each of your two classifications. This is only for balanced data, which obviously didn't fit very well to our scenario. Okay. And then you just have to work out uh, what these ends and rows actually mean in terms of your pupils, your secondary sc schools, your primary schools, and the, variance, variance, the various variance components. Okay. And what we see is actually, if you use that formula, for the balance case, it seems to mimic the behavior that we get from the simulations. Okay. But because these n terms here actually depend on the number of secondaries and the number of primary schools, there are actually lots of combinations, as you might expect, with two, with two factors that will give you the same power. Okay, so there's a lot of trade-offs going on. Okay. Okay. So, so that's me really done. Basically, what we've talked about is how we do sample size calculations in general and shown some results of using simulation uh, for cross-classified models. Uh, the software MLPowSim, which we, we used for this, it's free, it's on the web, so we welcome people to use it and give us some feedback about it, and thank you all for listening. I'm going to look at the backgrounds of the project, um, talk about the approach taken, the models used, and then uh, discuss our findings. So. Uh, in the standard format. Um, the background of the project um, is not, it's not educational research as in you know, results and things, it's all about mental health. Um, and there's increasing concern about the mental health of children in schools um, and the DCSF have put £60 million into um, measuring the mental health of, of children in schools and trying to fix it um, or improve it. Um, only a very small amount of that budget is actually going into assessing what works and what doesn't work. Most of the money is actually going into interventions to try and um, make some progress. Um, the evaluation team um, consists of a group from the Evidence-Based Practice Unit, known as EBPU, they stand in London, and they've got a whole lot of psychological experience. Um, and then the Chem Centre in Durham um, have got the experience of collecting the data. Uh, because this is an awful lot of data cl to collect here. Um, we also have some other guys like Tony um, who contribute to help the, um, with general expertise. Um, and obviously Tony's got statistical expertise, but we've got various other people who know all sorts of things that I don't even understand. Um, the scope of the project, um, there's about 100 local authorities in England and about and 25 of them are currently involved in the study. Um, there's another 40 coming on board this November and, um, and next November. Um, so that's, it's a, you know, most of the local authorities at the end of the um, project will actually be involved. Um, the, the 25 local authorities that are currently involved all opted to be involved. They put forward a plan of how they were going to improve the mental health of children in their care. Um, and that's... Um, and then there, they were selected, they were selected on the basis of those proposals. Um, I've had a quick look, and they do seem to be reasonably representative on the normal sort of measures. Um, anyway, these 25 local authorities then went and found about half a dozen secondary schools, and then about, and then the respective feeder primary schools for those secondary schools. Um, so, from that, we end up with. Uh, about getting on for 300 primary schools and about 80 secondary schools in total, um, which gives us about 20,000 pupils in total. Um, and um, yeah, and that's, that, that was, all that data was collected in November last year. Um, and then we're going to be getting more 
we're going to go through the same data again in this November, and the same data again the number in, in November 2010, um, except, of course, the project, project's actually getting big, bigger. Um, so we're going to end up with an awful lot of data, um, which is going to be a complete nightmare. But um, you shouldn't really uh, reject lots of data. It's always a good thing. <laughs> um, the, the, the way it works is each local authority um, has set up their own intervention or a series of interventions, lots of different bits and pieces, and they're just going ahead and doing that. And our job as the evaluation team is to work out what works and what doesn't work. Um, and this is, you know, also makes life tricky. Um, but we're not too worrying. We're not worrying about that at the moment. Um, the existing measures, um, or the key existing measure we're using, something called the Strength and Difficulties Questionnaire, which was developed by Robert Goodman in um, 2000. Um, it's a very well-established instrument. It's, you know, every, every psychologist I've met knows about it, um, even though I personally hadn't heard of it before we started using it. Um, it has five measures. It measures the emotional difficulties of children, conduct difficulties of children, hyperactive difficulties of children, um, peer relationship problems, and uh, pro-social behaviour. Um, not only does it have surveys which are well-established for pupils, it also has surveys for teachers and parents. Um, it's available in a paper or an electronic format. Um, it comes in th over 30 different languages. Um, and there is background population data from previous studies. Um, so it's a very well-established measure. Um, but there's a couple of major disadvantages of it. Um, the format is, um, is it's a written format. Um, and it's, it's rather hard for um, year four children, which is where we've been looking at. Um, but it's also... It's not also it's not always accessible to some year seven children as well, um, because it because of its format and the nature of the words it uses. Um, then the previous implementation or the implementations that are generally available aren't large scale. That they're ideal for a psychologist sitting down with a child and walking them through the questions, or the child just sort of walking through the questions on their own. Um, it's not designed for screening twenty thousand children in one go. Um, so we've had to look at um, alternative measures. Um, as I say, the SDQ is the best of the available measures at the moment. Um, and so we've had to develop a new measure. Um, which we've called the me and my school measure. Um, which we've designed specifically to work with year four and year seven pupils. Um, it's an on-screen assessment with audio support so you know, if they have struggle reading then they can just listen um, the questions are answered on never sometimes or always scale so it's a you know, dead easy scale for for children to work with um, there's four key subsections um, conduct difficulties emotional difficulties self-esteem school climate and uh, then there's also some additional surveys which aren't really part of the me, me and my school survey, um, um, but they ha we have done them as well, which contributes to our um, vast, num vast quantity of data. Um, that's a typical screenshot from the survey. Um, as you can see, it's designed to be fairly child-friendly. Um, anyway, having done this, we've... Um, total up the six scores so we've got an emotional score a conduct score for year four um, then we've got an emotional score and a conduct score from the me and my school survey for year seven plus we also did the sdq survey for the year seven to give us something to very to, val to validate against um, and the key thing we can see here how do I do this? Um, the correlations between the two emotional measures for year seven are quite high um, and the correlations between the conduct measures for year seven are quite high whilst the cross-correlations between the two are relatively low. Um, obviously, this data here is all blank because we haven't got pupils in year seven and, year, and in year four. Um, the data structure is pretty standard. We've got the, um, the whole cohort up top, and we've got local authorities, year four and year seven. Um, we've got the... Well, then we've got schools and the classes and the pupils. Um, we haven't modelled all of these at all the steps. 
um, but that, that's the sort of the underlying structure. Um, so the approach we've taken, um, we've modeled the data with the with a multi-level model, um, because that, and that's a very popular um, approach for pupil level pupil type data because it allows you to count, count, account for the school and the local authority and the class potentially. Um, we can attribute effect to a cause, um, gender, free school meal, special educational needs, um, income deprivation affecting children index. Um, and we consider three levels of model because we've got a normal model, we've got the model with the pupil level data and we've got the model with the school level data. Um, we can look at the we can look at the distribution of the variance and how it changes with the model. Um, and the, um, the IDACI measure and the special educational needs measure with standardized to have uh, mean zero and variance of one. Um, so if we, if we split the variance using our multi level model, I'm not going to go into details, um, we find that about 1% to 2% typically is in the school um, remit, um, and very little is at the local authority remit. Um, now, at the moment, the local authorities aren't actually implementing their mental health strategies. So the hope is that the local authorities will go away and they'll start doing their, you know, this is how we're, this is how we're helping the mental health, and that will shoot up and become massive and really important um now frankly we don't think this is going to happen <laughs> but that, that that's what that's what the, the big plan is um the the smaller models so the models based on the pupil um and the normal models give more variance to the school um which is something i think you'd expect from this sort of model um So we've got a few key patterns here. Um, the one percent of the variance is explained by the local authority. Two percent of the variance is explained by the school, or up to five percent in the normal model, um, including the school level variables reduced to school level random effects. Again, that's what that's exactly what we'd expect. Um, Not quite sure what I'm supposed to point that out to make it move. Probably not the screen. Um, the the class effect has been, it hasn't been very easy to look at because the um, class data has been very dubious quality because um, it's not available centrally. Um, so some schools gave it to us. Sometimes the pupils had to give it to us, and they all typed it in, in different formats. Um, so the actual class data we've had has been very much more limited. Um, but it's been pretty obvious where we have had it that the class is more important than the school. Um, which is in line with previous findings. So the general findings, um, we've got um, strong, school, the school residual correlations um, sort of between 0.7 and 0.9, so quite high, strong, uh, quite high re residual correlations there. Um, and very similar coefficients. Um, and we've got very strong relationships between the uh, the emotional difficulties and the conduct difficulty measures um, for the me and my school and for the SDQ measures. So one of the key questions we've had, you know, we, we should be looking at here, um, and this is still quite tentative work, is when, we, when you invent a new measure, this uh, me and my school measure, um, how do you validate it? How do you persuade people that it's a good measure? Um, now, for the year seven data, that's a relatively, it's an it's a easier question because we've got the, the well-established SDQ, which everyone believes, um, everyone knows about. Um, so if you get a very strong relationship between the two, that's great. Um, now, the year four data is obviously a bit harder because we haven't got a well-established measure to compare to. Um, so how, how do we uh, 
go about proving it. Um, so what I've done here is I've taken the coefficients that have come out of the uh, multi-level model um, and I've just plotted them against each other for the six different measures of interest. And what we can see is that the, we've got a very strong positive relationship here, for example, between the year four mean my school emotional measure and the year seven mean my school emotional measure, but also between the year four mean my school emotional measure and the year seven STQ emotional measure. And this is replicated in the conduct measures as well. So what we're seeing here is that the same coefficients are appearing when we're measuring the same thing from different measures. So if, we're, if something is important for one conduct measure, it's important for all three conduct measures. If it's important for one emotional measure, it's important for all three emotional measures. And the actual correlations involved here are between 0.8 and 0.99 between the coefficients, which is a pretty high correlation to my way of thinking. Um, for both for emotion and for conduct. Um, and across emotion and conduct, the correlations are like minus 0.3, or between minus 0.6 and minus 0.3. So there really isn't a correlation between them, which again, to me, is sort of saying that um, you know, there, there's something going on here that isn't just you know, a general modelling effect. Um, and I, I'm, I'm still quite surprised at how, how strong the correlations are between the conduct measure coefficients and, and how weak they are across them. Um, the only, one thing I'm not sure to say here, we didn't include the ethnic um, origin information in this calculation uh, because there's obviously in the ethnic origin there's quite a lot of small groups um, which would have really biased the, um, any, any potential calculations. Um, so the correlations we're reporting here are based on 14 variables. Um, so it's not a massive number, but it's, it's a reasonable number. Um, so the, a question I have to put to you really is, does this approach validate the year four measure? Is it robust, and how could it be verified and improved? Um, I'd like to thank Tony for his support, and if you have any comments to help me answer these questions, I'd be very grateful.